data. It's, it's not so much that they can't send the data, and as, as Marianne has, has pioneered, there is increasing data transfer, uh, but the scaling of the infrastructure and data internationally is a little bit easier than, than co-locating uh, at all. There's some papers about this, this effort, there's some that have come through over the years on um, large-scale studies of the brain that have amassed data across different countries. And um, th this is quite a prolific project. There's about 70 papers a year. There was a special issue in human brain mapping showcasing applications uh, to different uh, diseases and different genetic uh, questions. So here, here's how the work's organized. So the, the, there's clinical working groups in Enigma. Many of you work on these topics. So in the middle, there's groups dedicated to brain injury, frontotemporal dementia, ataxia, epilepsy. Um, around the perimeter, you'll see at the top left, bipolar, schizophrenia, major depression. And then one of the things you'll notice is that there are not often big imaging studies of, for example, panic disorder, social anxiety, or I mean, if you said, well, you know, what are the major brain correlates of some of these disorders? There wouldn't be big, well-powered studies uh, already. And of course, these are very heterogeneous, so it's not the case that someone with a brain injury has the same etiology or prognosis if they were injured in the military or on the sports field or as a, as a child. So there are subgroups. So it's very, very hierarchical. There's subgroups tackling different sub-questions within the clinical domains. And then on the technical side, I mean, many of you are algorithm developers. And so there are special methods to harmonize and integrate and segment and process uh, MRI, diffusion MRI resting state. Uh, as we saw from Pedro and all of the brilliant people yesterday, I mean, there's new uh, frontiers in EEG and MEG for, for both reconstruction and interpretation. And then on the genetic side, I mean, much, if, if you haven't worked with these techniques, much like images do, there are techniques for epigenetics and, as Corey Stephenson said, copy number variation to call these uh, features in, in the genome or the epigenome and merge them across many, many sites. And so this is sort of the map of Enigma, the different uh, topics. There's new groups on pain and migraine, neuromodulation. There's some interventional studies in Enigma where data from different interventions are, are, are collected. And here, here's some of the people doing, doing the work. So to scale this, Ma Ma Morris had a very nice discussion yesterday on scaling neuroscience. The way that we've scaled this is, let's say you're interested in one disease. That might be disease one, and you have a group studying the MRI, DTI, and resting state. If the same methods are applicable to a second disease, maybe it's schizophrenia at the top, bipolar at the side, major depression, you could then have subgraphs of people that are interested in cross-disorder comparison of DTI, or it might be um, comparing major depression to PTSD with resting state. So there's, there's active, I, I think as Catherine showed at the beginning of the day yesterday, there's active highways between the different uh, uh, partners going on all the, all the time in this sort of modular hierarchical network of activity. And this has led to the largest neuroaging studies of, of nine different brain disorders. You can see this is the profile of gray matter thinning or, or lower gray matter thickness in depression, bipolar, schizophrenia, alcohol use disorder. Uh, some of these won't come as much of a surprise. Um, but to first order, this is just structural imaging. You could do the same thing. And these are meta-analyzed maps. So if each, each lab runs a pipeline and looks at case control differences, and that, that's a bit of a simplification of what's going on, but to first order, these are meta-analyzed maps uh, of brain structure. And you can, you can get the T-shirt. You've got to wear, wear your data occasionally. So I just want to link to the brilliant work that's being done in uh, HBHL and Big Brain and, 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 and Highball. Um, Justine Hansen and Bratislav Misik, at, at, I mean, you all, all know their work have linked the disease maps in Enigma to all of the aggregated molecular and connectomic mapping data that's being uh, put together in Neuromaps. Uh, Boris Bernhardt and Sarah Rivière, also from MNI, have been developing statistical tools to link connectomic gradients uh, and other novel features from brain imaging data to these, these maps. And you can ask some cool questions. So Sophie Volk, who's also here, and, and Micah Hetwer, we're also working along the same lines. And they said, well, for the disease maps, at least the deficits structurally, do they resemble patterns of molecular content, uh, either myelination, synaptic density, or some other cytoarchitectonic attribute of the cortex? Do they 
tend to, do you have vulnerable areas of the cortex that share similar characteristics in terms of connectivity, uh, functional synchrony? And uh, it, Bratislav Misik sa said on Twitter, this is a connectomic molecular death match. It was his way of saying, you know, can we find some uh, fundamental neuroscience principle as to why the cross disorder uh, abnormalities are as they are? Thomas Paus and Yash Patel have also been looking at uh, uh, cellular gene expression tags. There are certain genes that are expressed specifically in neurons, astrocytes, and, and so forth. So if you had a map of their gene expression, you could infer what kinds of cells and in what regions uh, they were. And much as we've seen over the last couple of days, having these new tools through uh, Highball and, and HBHL and uh, the Global Rain Consortium led by Alan and, and, and Pedro is really helping to bridge these uh, different disciplines of neuroscience. And last of all, a shout out to uh, Boris Bernhardt and Sarah Larivier. They have been hugely instrumental in Enigma and many other projects in allowing us to bridge in vivo imaging maps of disease uh, to uh, gene expression, other multimodal data on brain connectivity. And as you saw in, in Justine Hansen uh, and uh, Jessica Roy and, and, and uh, Raul Cruz's uh, talks on the first day, the, these, uh, these methods are quite easy to use. Even a, aging neuroscientists like me can get out their laptop and run uh, these different uh, comparisons. So let, let, let's take a step back. So I, Mariana gave a really nice talk uh, on the origins of these types of, of efforts. I want to say 30 years ago when Alan and his colleagues came to the lab, I was a graduate student, and this was actually quite new to line uh, individual brain maps into a common stereotactic uh, reference frame and then build cortical models. I mean, all of these methods were first appearing in, in, in the 90s. And even the notion of a statistical parametric map of a, of a disease, in this case, Alzheimer's disease, there was a lot of excitement that here the cortical thinning pattern for Alzheimer's could be related one day to the, here, the amyloid pattern of pathology that is contributing to Alzheimer's disease. And you can even see, I mean, this is a very crude map, but you can even see there's a, a, an architectonic uh, segregation uh, where the BRAC maps and the uh, imaging uh, do tend to agree. The, um, the raw data doesn't really show it. I mean, th this is someone with Alzheimer's over a period of uh, four years. I mean, except for the ventricular enlargement, you'd be very hard pressed, uh, at least to, to my eye, uh, to, to see any um, uh, specific cortical pattern of disease. It's very, very difficult to see. So you could compile uh, for different diseases time-lapse films, and so th th this was very popular in the early 2000s, that you would take serial images of a patient, this is cortical gray matter deficits versus controls. Presumably, if you had some healthy controls, you would say, tell me where and when in the cortex the gray matter thinning is significant, the white colors in this case denoting uh, significance. And from that, in this case, looking at Alzheimer's, you could infer what the cortical trajectory uh, of that disorder uh, might be. And I mean, you could certainly do this for different diseases. So d d does anyone know what disease this is? I'll, I'll, I'll play it again. Alan, you're not allowed to answer because I, th I think you're under study. Uh, so th th this is a group of patients scanned by Judy Rappaport. She, she was interested in schizophrenia and its development uh, in, in, in adolescence. It doesn't really look like uh, Alzheimer's. That, that was part of work in, in the early 2000s in drug trials where the, the question was whether antipsychotics slowed gray matter thinning. This is a drug trial of olanzapine, the newer drug at the time, uh, showing that it, it, it resisted gray matter thinning, albeit that unlike Alzheimer's, we don't really know what the gray matter thinning is uh, in, in, in schizophrenia. And then in the background, um, does anyone know what disease this is? It's a trick question. I'll, I'll play it again. Anyone has other guesses what disease this is? It's, it's not a disease, it's aging. It's aging. So, so I mean, let, let's play it again. The, the conundrum then is, I mean, if you have a soup of things going on in your brain, of, of aging and maybe some uh, dementia and old age and maybe some schizophrenia, or it, all, all those other maps that we talked about that Boris uh, has been putting together, uh, in, in the toolboxes. How, how, how do you disentangle them? I mean, it's a little bit difficult. So one way in is Enigma 
assemble the control. So Pedro talked about a wonderful project yesterday with EEG where you make a normative model. So you collect measures from EEG. In this case, it's from structural imaging. This is the volume of the thalamus. And Centile Brain is a tool that has aggregated all across Enigma the control data, in this case from 18,000 people from 35 countries. And it's given you percentiles. I mean, th this is assuming that the inclusion criteria for the studies are reasonably similar. I mean, you're ruling out people with psychiatric or neurological uh, illness. And the, the, the data, I mean, you could just look at it as individual data like this. You could query it. Centile Brain lets you download data and do so, some studies with it. And you, you could say, well, what is the mean trajectory for healthy people all over the world? That little uptick at the end, we don't get more brain when we're 90. <laughs> the, the, the only people still willing to come to the scanner when they're 90 are pretty unusual, so that's what's going on there. But look, look at how dissimilar uh, the, the maturational trajectories are for some of our favorite structures. And you, you could look in, in kids. So Rebecca Nickmeyer leads Enigma Origins. I mean, she's been doing this uh, for, for infants. I mean, you could certainly make your growth charts for, for, for infants as well. And I mean, that's much more well behaved. And um, you could make a normative model. So let, let, let's say someone has an eating disorder and they, they have anorexia and they are, are given re-nutrition. You just see if the brain and body are getting back on track. You could use these charts to gauge um, wh whether or not they've recovered. Now, now there's a bit of a, a secret here. So this is a normative model of DTI based on 50,000 people. The data coming in on the bottom left isn't really like the nice looking data that's there in the graph. So there's a huge site effect. So this is the FA, uh, the fractional isotropy. Um, I can't remember what, which structure. It's probably the corpus callosum. And even though you have this well-behaved data, there's a site difference and a protocol difference. If you have big voxels, the FA is going to be lower. And so for every site, there's a trajectory. And, and just to sort of let, let you know how these are used, if you download the normative curve and you plot your patient data onto it, it doesn't mean all of your controls are abnormal if you see a shift like that. What is usually typical is you will do a site correction or a hierarchical Bayes model that will model the age dependency in your data and a site and protocol effect. And there's a, a little bit of a guidebook, a site effects guidebook on how to model these. One way is, is combat, and for the mathematicians here, you have the age trajectory that everyone in the world has created, mm -hmm. and then you have a site effect, which is both a shift and a multiplicative site effect, which are the gammas and the deltas that are there. And the site effects are modeled with a site-dependent shift and a scale and an alignment of all the higher order moments of the, of the data. You can do an F-test to see which ones differ from the normative data. And that allows proper assembly of lifespan charts for the brain measures, even if the different protocols uh, don't look uh, exactly like that. So let, let's get into genetics. So Curry Stephenson said yesterday that he, he and his decode colleagues had discovered TREM2, a really cool paper 10 years ago. TREM2 is, uh, uh, well, uh, the variant in TREM2 that, that carries risk for Alzheimer's disease doubles your risk for Alzheimer's disease, which is very bad. And 1% of us carry, carry it. So if you had a large database, you could go and get everyone with TREM2, uh, the, the adverse variant, and see if they lose brain tissue faster. I mean, why, why do you get Alzheimer's at twice the, twice the rate if you carry a, a, a TREM2? And this is useful for drug trial en enrichment. If you're trying to test an anti-amyloid drug or an anti-dementia drug, you want to enroll people who are uh, declining or likely to decline uh, faster than everyone else. And so how do we find genes like TREM2? I mean, maybe there's three billion base pairs, and some of them speed up or slow down your brain tissue loss or amyloid accumulation or something else. So the Psychiatric Genomics Consortium collects DNA and clinical data from around 100,000 people. And there was some optimism about 15 years ago that if you were connecting DNA variation to imaging variation, it'd be much more efficient. Because rather than all of the vagaries of diagnosis, you'd have a quantitative biomarker. And if you could measure that precisely in the same way across the world, maybe you'd only need 1,000 people. Maybe you wouldn't need 100,000 people uh, to make that connection. And one reason why you need a lot of data is the multiple testing. So if you're in the genome and you do multiple testing at different letters of the DNA, you, you have to correct for accidental findings, and the sample sizes needed to do that go up. So an early skeptic is my friend Nick Martin. He, he's the most highly cited scientist in the Southern Hemisphere. 
And he was the president of the Behavioral Genetics Association in, in 2009. And he, he had managed genetic studies all over the world, much like Corey Stephenson has done. And he said, you know, if you want to discover genes that affect the brain, you'll need brain images from 50,000 people. Just because images are more expensive to collect than measures of height or weight, it doesn't change the power calculations. Do you, do you believe him? What, do you think, as images, do you think he's correct? I know, we'll, we'll, we'll answer the question in a minute. So, so we, did, we did that. Um, we collected images from, in this case, 33,000 people across the world. And for those of you not familiar with these Manhattan plots in genetics, the x-axis is the genome. The height of the peak is the strength of association between genetic variation at that point in the genome, and in this case, the size of some of the subcortical structures. And just to be precise, if you measure something in the brain and you look at the genomic data, in the same way as we register images to a template, they can impute genetic data to a common reference. It's called imputation. And so all the same sites in the genome can be either um, genotyped or imputed based on the most likely uh, letter. And then it, it's basically an integer valued regression. I mean, you could say I've measured amyloid or brain synchrony or EEG uh, um, spectra. I'd like to find if there's anything in the genome that shows a linear association. You, you, you can adjust for age and sex and other things, but essentially it's linear regression at each point. And so this does work. I mean, you could do this to Alzheimer's patients and controls, and you would get APOE. So I mean, let, let, let's say you said, tell me where in the genome has statistical differences in the code between people with Alzheimer's disease and healthy elderly people. APOE would come up as this astronomical hit. It, it, it triples your risk if you carry the APOE4 genotype. But there's plenty of other loci in the genome that affect your risk for Alzheimer's by about 10 to 20 percent. Um, you, you could basically um, create a polygenic risk score. You could say, let's add up all of the Alzheimer conferring loci in the genome. And for you personally, look at the letter that you have in those locations. And based on a, just like deep learning, a weighted linear combination of, of those markers, um, you could find um, your, your risk of Alzheimer's at any age, that's age 60 through 100. And you can see that if you're in the top 1% of risk, I mean, there's almost inevitable uh, incidence of Alzheimer's disease, at least later in life. And the, these charts, are, you, you'll maybe remember Desikan from the Desikan Kiliani Atlas. He's very, very sadly passed away uh, from ALS. Uh, he was a UCSF faculty uh, member. But this notion of a polygenic score that links your genome to your health outcomes, you can do it for the brain as well. It's so, sort of interesting. So not all the diseases are the same. If you do a genome-wide search for loci associated with schizophrenia, it's a little bit messier. So as they added data to the Psychiatric Genomics Consortium over the years, more and more hotspots in the genome became linked or at least statistically associated with schizophrenia. This is uh, the Manhattan plot. It looks like Manhattan in New York, the skyscrapers and what have you. The points that cross that threshold where the log of the p-value, the negative log of the p-value is at least seven, they are locations that pass the Bonferroni correction. So if you look at a million nucleotides, I mean, probably 5% of them will come up by accident as crossing 0.05, if that's the threshold. So instead, they have this very stringent so-called genome-wide association threshold, which is why so many subjects are usually recruited for these. So Enigma piggybacked on the PGC's approach and computed measures from brain scans, tested associations between the brain measures and SNPs, and then the PGC does this, so we borrowed it. We meta-analyzed the effects. So if you had a Manhattan plot at each site, you could weight them according to how much uh, data each site was contributing. And if you scanned 100 people or if you were the UK Biobank and you scanned 50,000 people, the weight of your sample could be, could be factored in. So the first discovery was that there are apoptotic uh, cell death related genes where polymorphisms are related to atrophy. So that is a, it's not as nice a hippocampus as the ones we saw yesterday, but this is a hippocampal model. The, the front of the hippocampus shows localized, um, I won't say atrophy, it was differences in structure that are linked with apoptotic gene uh, variation. Um, this lady in Dagestan called us. She works in the ethnic isolates of Dagestan in the Caucasus Mountains. And she said that area of the genome that's linked to hippocampal volume 
has also been linked uh, in these genetic isolates uh, to uh, they, they're very inbred. I mean, there's areas of the world where there's not much leaving of the area, and this, this is one of them. It's in Dagestan. And she was their doctor, and so she went to this community, genotyped them, and linked, linked the same hippocampal gene uh, to mental retardation uh, in, in, in this isolate, which is a very, very cool functional correlate of this. This kept going, and so you could find lots of genetic loci. What, what about APOE? So APOE, we said, was linked to Alzheimer's risk later in life. If you look in the genome and you find APOE, its association with hippocampal volume is age dependent. So when you're 20, if you carry APOE4, there's no impact at all, at least on hippocampal volume. But by the time you get to 60 or 70, you'll remember Corey Stephenson said APOE4 carriers have a precipitous decline in cognition between age 55 and 68. And it looks like there's this massive erasing of hippocampal volume later in life. So there's a little bit of nuance here. APOE doesn't always come up in a, in a GWAS. And it's because if you have young people in your GWAS, you won't see the effect. So you have to be th thinking a little bit ahead that some of these genes might act during a certain period of the lifespan. And if you throw all the data together, you might obscure that. So, so you can do this for all sorts of brain measures. Here's brain volume, intracranial volume, uh, work, work by Heav Adams. Uh, the tau gene, so microtubule associated protein tau, or just tau, is very famous. And so there's polymorphisms in the tau gene that lead to Parkinson's, ALS, uh, to some extent Alzheimer's. And people that have the Parkinson's disease conferring risk variant of tau have bigger brains. So that's, that's very strange. They, they have larger brains than normal. It's not, there might be a what Alan Daguerre at McGill calls an antagonistic pleiotropy, uh, uh, an early beneficial effect of this polymorphism, which might keep it around uh, in, in human populations, but a later negative effect. Here's the Parkinson's GWAS. I mean, you'll see that it's the second top hit if you screen Parkinson's patients for genetic anomalies, the other one being the synuclein alpha gene, which is involved in dopamine uh, neurotransmission. So you can keep going, and I mean, this is, this is sort of fun. I mean, what one intuition is that the genetic determinants of each structure might be in common uh, if the structures are close together or they have the same, the same function. And so you can look at this. So much like we were looking in the past couple of days at overlap in the cytoarchitectonics or the myeloarchitecture or the function of different islands uh, of the brain, you can say, well, all these loci that affect the volume of different structures, are, are they partially overlapping? Are there genetic programs that determine sectors uh, of, the, of the basal ganglia? And the first thing to notice is that a polygenic score, you can just add up the letters that you have in the genome at certain locations, weight them by the impact they have on, in this case, the volume of the structures. And that score alone accounts to 5 to 10% of the volume variation in controls, which is, is going to go up. I mean, this the fraction of the variance that is uh, modeled using GWAS, I mean, we certainly aren't near the limit. And so you could easily predict, uh, probably better than most predictors, uh, the size of these measures from, uh, for, from the genome. Now, let's go back to Nick Martin's assertion. He said, you're going to need millions of people to find all the genomic markers that affect the brain. But that's not true. So the, the x-axis is the number of people you need. And the y-axis is the fraction of the genome that is associated with a brain metric that has been discovered using GWAS. And the blue curve is the GWAS of the putamen. I just picked that because it was successful. And the green curve is the schizophrenia GWAS. And so they are now at, I think, uh, this is old data, they're now at nearly a million patients. And they haven't even begun to discover uh, over half of the genetic uh, variation that can be accounted for in relation to schizophrenia. And the reason these are different is quite, quite interesting. For traits that are monogenic or oligogenic, and they're usually the neurological disorders and the brain measures, you will find with very, uh, probably a 20th the number of people, the majority of the genetic variation that is, is associated with them. But for things like major depression, I mean, is major depression a genetic disorder? It might be a genetic li liability, but the main reason someone becomes depressed or exogenous. So doing a GWAS for major depression is going to be much less fruitful, and you'll find markers at a much lower rate and with much less penetrance and individual effects. So this is 
actually kind of an interesting guide because if you wanted to discover genetic loci that affect the brain, you could make these plots and look at phenotypes that were in a sense the most promising uh, given the uh, invested time. I'm trying to link this back to big brain and the, the brain mapping uh, activities going on uh, at a cellular scale. If you were to look at the genomic loci that influence the precentral and postcentral gyrus, in this case the surface area, they partially overlap and they're partially different. So if you were steering around the cortex and you sort of had a searchlight that was unearthing the genomic loci that, that, that mattered. So th this paper is in, in Science in 2020 and there's one or two uh, authors of it. Try, try to get into this. So just looking at the genetic loci, I, I, I'm not a geneticist, but that doesn't seem like there's any, any pattern or even there are hotspots of the genome that seem to affect the, the cortex more than others, but uh, they don't seem to be housed in any famous uh, re regulatory or at least from a genetic standpoint uh, categories. Um, there are sectors of the cortex that are affected en masse by little units uh, of, of the genome. This is all common variation. And you can stack up the Manhattan plots. On one axis, there's the brain regions. On the other axis, there's the genome. It's one of Alan's N squared problems. There's sort of all the genetic variation, all the imaging variation. And look at that. And there are genetic modules. And so you, you could say, well, if I'm in this region of the brain, how correlated is the genetic determination with another region? And for all pairs, you could make a genetic correlation matrix. You could do hierarchical clustering. And you could say, fundamentally, there are blocks of the cortex that have shared, shared genetics. And I, I think it's so exciting the last few days of, of, of tools, you could begin to relate these things to things we know about individual gene expression uh, or you know, developmental sequences onto genetically. Uh, I mean, maybe many of these genes exert their effect in very, very early infancy as part of the genetic program that structures the, the human cortex. Now, the, the loci that affect disease affect, are the same ones to, to a great extent as the loci that affect the brain. And so that's not entirely surprising. So if you think the brain is on a causal pathway uh, to, to how the genes uh, influence disease, it is. Then you can also do regional anatomic uh, questioning of, of that hypothesis. Are the genes affecting this region? Some are the same ones that affect disease. The strongest links are with Parkinson's and some of the developmental disorders. We don't know why insomnia comes, come, comes up as, a, as one of the top ones, but um, you, you can use this data. You can access it from Enigma's browser and go get either the maps for a particular gene or the other way around for a particular cortical region, the genes, I mean, the sort of a bi, bilateral indexing of that kind. Now, Curry Stephenson talked about rare variation yesterday. So rare variation is if there's a variant that happens in, in less than one in a thousand people, so we, so far we've talked about SNPs or common variants that all of us have, and once you get to 10,000 people in the database, you'll probably have 10 of these. And so what, what ends up happening is, I mean, you, you all know about Huntington disease, where, Huntington's disease where there's um, trinucleotide repetition of an area of the genome, the CAG repeat sequence that is uh, associated with greatly increased risk of motor disorders later in life. But there are, there are many of these, and I mean, they're, they're quite rare, so we don't hear about them very much. But you can rank rare variants by their frequency. Once you've done a GWAS, they're easy to find. They're usually just not there. I mean, a deletion is, is something that won't come up on the genotyping. And you can make a library of these. So Sébastien Jacquemont in Montreal, Clara Moreau, who was in Montreal and now is at USC, and Carrie Bearden have made catalogs of the effects of rare variants on the brain some of them are famous, 22Q deletion syndrome uh, is a risk syndrome for schizophrenia and for psychosis, 16P11 for autism. So there's a lot of interest in whether the genetic path to these disorders has the same brain signature as the idiopathic path, the usual way that people get these disorders. So we, we all know this gentleman. And so he, <laughs> Curry Stephenson, who gave a magisterial lecture yesterday, uh, he said, you know, we have in Iceland a very large database. <laughs> And we've been genotyping CNVs, and, and he said, wouldn't it be a good idea if we checked your results? Because we could look if the Icelanders with the rare variants have the same brain uh, shifts. And it's very, very close. Let, let's zoom it up here. So this is one rare deletion. It's the second most common one on chromosome 16. A deletion leads to schizophrenia. A duplication leads, not always, but uh, a lot of the time, to autism. 
And the Enigma effect size on, these are subcortical structure volumes. The Enigma effect size is shown at the top. The effect in decode is shown next. And then if you meta-analyze them, I mean, we could debate whether you should be doing that, but the, the effect size, and they really do agree. I mean, they really do. I mean, if, if neither consortium had evidence for the effect, it's pretty much uh, consistent. And even the direction and degree of effect is, uh, is close. So, so Decode and Enigma and uh, many colleagues in the H HBP uh, have been making catalogs uh, of these and looking for the effects in the brain. Here, here's Ida Sonderby from Oslo with her uh, map of all the rare variants and their effects on the brain. I mean, it's kind of a cool activity. What, what about brain function? So I, the, this is for Pedro. And so the, 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 the brain structure is, is uh, convenient to assess genetically. Um, but EEG is actually more convenient. I mean, it, as Pedro said yesterday, you can have an EEG in uh, tw 20 minutes in a hotel. That was done in a hotel. Um, this also works. So you, you can apply all the same principles. If you look at an EEG-derived marker, it may be power in a certain spectral band. Um, you could link genome variation to, I mean, mathematical measures of oscillatory brain activity. This is work by Dirk Smith. A lot of the discovered loci are in uh, the GABA pathway, so the major inhibitory neurotransmitter uh, GABA. There are receptor polymorphisms that are linked. They've already been linked before any of this to alcoholism and epilepsy and uh, disorders of inhibition. I mean, if you think of GABA and what would happen if you didn't have a functional GABA system, you could imagine some of these uh, pathologies could emerge. And so there are genomic markers that affect f at EEG measures of functional brain syn synchrony that are overlap with the ones that are implicated uh, in alcoholism and epilepsy, but it gives you a mechanism uh, as to how those genes might be conferring conferring risk. Now, another one, this is, this is sort of interesting, it, epigenetics. So here, here's Sylvain de Rivière. She's at uh, King's College London, and she's an expert in methylation of the genome. So for those of you that don't do this a lot, as well as your genetic code, there's lifespan variation in the degree of expression of the genes. It's not like the computer program runs the same every day. And as a gene is methylated, more often than not, it will regulate the expression of a certain gene, often to shut it down. Or um, if, if it's an anti-proliferative gene, it can cause cancer. I mean, the methylation might suppress a suppressor, and then you have proliferation. So she's found that methylation of Hox genes, or homeobox genes, which in fact segment the embryo during neurogenesis, um, predicts regional brain volumes relatively well. There's just not as much um, epigenetic data at the moment uh, from people who've been scanned, but this is a very promising uh, uh, line of work. And um, the other one that drug companies are interested in is, are there genomic markers that affect the speed or the rate uh, uh, of atrophy or, I mean, the, the, the dynamic rate of change of a certain process? And Rachel Brower and Hilke Holsoff-Paul, who's a longtime colleague of, of Alan's and ours, they asked if anyone had two scans uh, and genetic data. And here are the loci in the genome that are associated with the rate of either developmental change in childhood and a different set of genes associated with the loss of tissue in, in, in old age. And I mean, these would be very nice targets. I mean, they, they, presumably if they are acting negatively, they would become a target for drug trials. Okay, so the mathematicians among you are saying, why, why do geneticists use such horrible statistics? Why, why would you visit each location in the genome? I mean, it's like SPM. I mean, you'd visit each pixel and see. I mean, isn't there more holistic understanding of what's going on than that? So Enigma is called Enigma because, well, many of you that are familiar with the wartime code-breaking uh, effort, um, they wrote decoding machines. And so, I mean, I think in a sense that's what we're doing as brain mappers and, and, uh, uh, and as geneticists. So there are other models that take genomic variation and brain variation as multivariate patterns, and the deep learners among you would really like these problems. You can use autoencoders, you could use uh, any number of classical multivariate techniques to relate patterns of genomic variation to patterns of brain synchrony activity uh, at the multivariate level. Um, you could also, Alan and I were talking about this yesterday, do voxel wise GWAS. Uh, you, you, you might need Morris's computer to do this. This is, might, might take a little while to crunch through. But it does work. Uh, it, it, if you say 
Tell me about one of the top hits in the GWAS for Putamen volume. Can you just voxel by voxel do VBM or some voxel based morphometry technique and tell me where it is it's exerting its effect? You'll see that in Adney or Hunt, which is a Norwegian cohort, or QTIM is a Queensland, Australia cohort, these are under a thousand individuals each, and the brain maps are not very convincing in each cohort. But when they're meta analyzed, I mean, that looks pretty good. And so I think that just sort of proves that you need at least 3,000 people, even for these top loci, to give a consistent signature of, a, of association. The, the other philosophy is you could do um, pattern analysis in images when you do clustering or your favorite uh, multivariate decomposition of images. You could look at gradients. That would be a cool uh, topic. You could, you could pull out a signature that has a more holistic meaning. And Christos de Vatsikos at UPenn uh, has been looking at the genetics of patterns, which in, in something like dementia, it's reasonable to think there might be patterns of dynamic uh, evolution. The other thing that's a big uh, uh, technical, oh, didn't that disappear? That might be uh, the unceremonious end of the talk. No, it's back. <laughs> So the, oh, I better not breathe. Have I screwed it up? Let's see, let's see if we can get that back. Okay. If that slide were here, there'd be, <laughs> there'd be uh, I'll just carry on as if it's there. There'd be histograms of signal variation. Uh, and uh, yeah, maybe PJ, we should get the slide. It's more interesting, wouldn't it? Uh, sorry, folks. Uh, I think I might have nudged it. Or well, maybe I tripped over something. All right. It was doing wonderfully, and then maybe I nudged it. Hmm. Oh, you didn't work with. All right, I'll stand well back. <laughs> All right. Thanks very much, and thanks for your patience. So I glossed over the effects of protocol. And the, those of you that work with DTI as an example know that if you collect large voxel data, the FA and plenty of other things aren't going to be comparable. And so there's huge work on harmonization. I mean, this is work by Neda Jahanshad uh, at USC, where deep learning, adversarial deep learning, is used to adjust the contrast of scans from one scanner to appear as though they were collected on another. You don't even need paired data. You don't have to have somebody who was scanned at both places. And this line of work, um, I, I'm moving a little bit into the AI area now, has been used to improve the agreement between data sets collected on different scanners. So my, you might be familiar with cyclegans. If you have a painting and you'd like to know what the scene looked like in real life, or maybe you just want the painting, you could learn from examples of Monet and photographs how the style affects the, the, the picture. And so they've used that concept to do style transfer for, for MRI. Um, it, it, it does work. It's kind of cool. I mean, the, the, the methods work. Jerry Prince at Hopkins has another way of doing this. It's a more physics-based approach where you say, really, a T1 and a T2 image, there's physical principles that govern how these scans look. So maybe we can make a manifold of the scanner uh, variations and have that uh, create a contrast that resembles the reference data. The reason I'm emphasizing this is if you were to use normative charts or join in with a genetic project, if your scans segment a little lower in volume or have some characteristic that makes them look off, all of the things fall down like a house of cards. And so a lot of this harmonization work um, is being used and very elaborate machine learning methods. And they not only help detect uh, genomic variation that's linked with with brain metrics, but also uh, downstream applications like Al Alzheimer's classification. So last little bit, maybe 15 minutes. Um, all the same arguments we've talked about relating genomic variation to images are applicable to disease. And I mean, that's obvious. I mean, it, it, but you, you could apply the same reasoning to data on a particular disorder or disease collected across the world. Here's Enigma schizophrenia work, 33 global samples. Um, you could say what is the best individual biomarker uh, in the brain that's linked to schizophrenia here. It looks like it's the fusiform gyrus. And that effect size, a Cohen's D of about minus a half, means that the patients are shifted by about half a standard deviation uh, in the volume of the structure versus controls. It's not, a, not as big of an effect as Alzheimer's, which is more like one or two 
standard deviations. And you can map it to the brain. So sort of going back to linking disease maps to big brain and to the other sources of neuroscience data, you could say, well, how do these diseases resemble each other or differ from each other? So this is kind of a fun animation here. So there's schizophrenia. These are gray matter deficits. Uh, deletion syndrome, there's gray matter excess. Epilepsy is very heavy gray matter loss. Um, there's OCD, very different pattern. There's thalamic changes in OCD. Hypertrophy and autism, which we know, know, know about, uh, hyperproliferation. Um, addiction is often a disorder of the frontal uh, cortex and limbic system. I mean, there's certainly atrophy in uh, people with alcohol use disorder uh, in that area. So thinking of how we could work together on, on these projects, I mean, people have a very specific focus on the disease they're looking at without necessarily relating any of these things to the wealth of neuroscience data that's coming through. But you could imagine uh, a, a, a scan uh, looking at depression or bipolar. I mean, here, here we see the frontal areas are more uh, atrophied or, or impaired in bipolar disorder than major depression. And you could look at all sorts of things. So this is a study looking at medication, and it has a very odd result that the people taking the most medication have the worst brain structure. This is why Enigma is not a good model for doing a randomized clinical trial, because people are not given medication randomly. The people that are sick are getting the most medication. So just in the back of your mind, you should bear in mind that some of these patterns do depend on other things. I mean, you won't always get the same effect at every site, and the meta-analyzed results aren't going to be exactly what you find. So in Japan, there's an Enigma Japan study where they scan people. The rank order of biomarkers in the brain is essentially the same. So if you have schizophrenia in Japan, you might get different medication, but the brain biomarkers are very similar indeed. Um, you can do this with VBM. This is an OCD meta-analysis of VBM. And rather than a couple of regions coming up, you get pretty much uh, the whole brain. But what they are finding, I mean, just talking specifically about OCD, is rather than the disorder having a signature that you can expect to repeat, across the world, whether or not a structure is abnormal at all depends on three things. Duration of illness, longer illness, worse it is. Age of onset, again, earlier age of onset, worse it is. And percent medicated, which goes the wrong way. So the people with the worst brain structure have the greatest behavioral deficits, typically receive the most medication. And so if you look at a um, cross-sectional data set in psychiatry, you'll very often find this, I mean, at first it looks horrifying that the medication is causing a huge problem. But if you get your causality uh, in the right order, I mean, very often these factors, you'll see heavily medicated people have the most abnormal brain structure and function. Um, what other applications could there be? So there, there, there is interest in uh, remediation and therapy. People with anorexia can receive treatment and their brains do, do get better. This is work by Esther Walton and, and Stefan Ehrlich. Anorexia has the greatest impact of any psychiatric disorder on the structural morphology of the brain, with the exception of the um, traumas uh, and late, late life uh, neurological disorders and, and uh, obviously things like GBM. But of all the psychiatric disorders where there's no uh, known brain mechanism or that's officially accepted, the effect size is about one standard deviation uh, of deficit in, in, in patients. And here's an age-old question. So T Tim Crow is a British guy that always used to say schizophrenia is associated with diminished lateralization of the brain. So th th this is, was an enigma challenge uh, to see if there was any evidence for that at all. Uh, and there barely is. So, so if you look at the asymmetry of the brain in people with schizophrenia uh, and typical people, it is slightly diminished, but the Cohen's D is 0.05. So that's a, uh, I don't know, a 20th of a standard deviation of difference. But I think he's officially correct that, uh, that asymmetry is reduced. And you, you also have another dimension of variation that I've overlooked so far. If a disorder is progressive, uh, as Parkinson's disease is, and perhaps many of the psychiatric disorders are progressive, you should do this in a stage-dependent way. So the, these are the stages of PD assessed clinically, stages one to five. And the trajectories that we saw earlier, which have very different involvement at different stages of the disease, uh, should obviously be separately mapped. It wouldn't, for instance, in this case, make sense to meta-analyze uh, the, the results. So 
I, I might draw to a close. There is more, but I, I, I'd like to be able to take uh, some questions. I, I, I do want to skip to the very end and talk about a couple of new directions. So one of them is you could say, well, Paul, you, you, you've spent 30 years doing brain mapping and you've, you've focused on the size of parts of the brain. I mean, that seems like a very uh, dull use of, of the brain mapping technology. So I'm hoping, you know, maybe in the next 10 years together, we can look into more sophisticated neuroscientific questions. So you, you could certainly ask, um, I mean, there's been talks about this. This is Camille Urbil's uh, work in, 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 uh, in Minnesota. For the connectivity or all the maps of um, correlation or association that we've been hearing about over the last few days, how do they relate to genetics? So let's say you embed your connectivity matrices into 2D and you go back to voxel wise GWAS. You could certainly do a GWAS on that. In fact, there's only 70 by 70 entries there. That's not a full cortex by cortex uh, a Cartesian product. And so you could basically, and th th this is underway, do a connectivity GWAS. This is um, quite interesting. In this case, you're not looking at a region, you're looking at a pairwise interaction and whether or not a genomic uh, marker uh, influences it. You could actually, rather than do a blind search, you could start with the, the loci that look like they're linked in some way to the measures so far, and then you would not have such a heavy correction. Because I think, as Alan mentioned, this is an n squared, or maybe it's an n cubed problem. It's a part of the brain to a part of the brain is two dimensions of variation. And then the genomic variation is being screened. It's, it's more like Pedro's tensor, the 3D tensor of the lag in the two regions. And when the search space is that large, it's probably unwise uh, to go hunting uh, because of the heavy correction. But maybe there's some clever random field theory or mathematical uh, approach to make that tractable. I did gloss over the environment. So, so Lauren Selman has been geocoding scans. This is also an effort that I know many of you are involved with. To link, I mean, much, much like uh, neuromaps, uh, brain scan locations to ambient pollution, climate, urban density, uh, other, it could be social factors. There are social determinants of health that can be geographically mapped. And so this data is in the process of being uh, pulled in. Um, you can do this anonymously, and so you could exchange the indexed uh, environmental data without saying uh, to the analyst where the person was or what their identity is. So that's kind of interesting. And given, I, so this doesn't happen in Iceland. Apparently in Iceland there's not very much. I think Maurice, you were sending some statistics. Iceland's the place to be if you don't want to be exposed to, to these things. But because obviously they matter for brain health and health in general, uh, you would want to uh, factor them in. So, so some sociological lessons. Uh, this maybe comes back to Marianne's talk uh, on, on the first day. I think the sociology of this is, is potentially much more important, or equally important, as, as the um, computing and the data. It's been very politically beneficial for projects to be led from different countries. I know uh, Katrin Amundsen and her colleagues with the HPP have pioneered the notion that you could have multi-country collaborations that are highly uh, successful with leadership in different places. There's greater power and efficiency, and there is, a, you know, as Morris has said, distributed computing, but there's also more, more expertise. I mean, we've all learned in the last two days approaches that we would never alone have, have thought to use. So for this reason, there are data collection efforts in Enigma. So I, I, I made it look like everything is retrospective data analysis. There's some parts of the world where there's not a lot of data. The India Enigma Initiative is, is collecting lifespan data uh, there. I mean, the goal is to find if there are uh, influential fa factors in India that perhaps aren't operating elsewhere. There's Enigma activities collecting data from in infants in, in Thailand and Cambodia. Very, very, they're very interested in, in um, infant HIV and whether antiretrovirals put your brain development back on track. So they, they lead the HIV group, which is appropriate. They, they're very knowledgeable about HIV uh, and the brain. Uh, this one is on pause. We will not be doing that because the government says uh, it's un unwise, but that was a very, uh, very active project in, in, in Russia for some years. When I was a British citizen, I was allowed to travel to this place. Uh, as an American citizen, we cannot work. Th this was solved because the people in Iran who ran, in fact, the sleep group in Enigma, they moved to Germany. 
And so now we're allowed to work with them. You can, you're, allowed, you're not allowed in the US to work with an Iranian people if they're in Iran. But if they're in Germany, you can, you can do it. And uh, in a couple of weeks, we'll have Enigma Turkey. I mean, there's a lot of uh, interest in, in, in Turkey in collecting uh, brain data, uh, obviously at the boundary of the uh, you know, many cultures. And it's interesting what is happening there. And we, we talked about some of the others. Some of, some of these didn't really get off the ground. I don't want to act like it's all successful. So Qatar is a very rich country, and they have a genomic database. Um, if any of you want to go there and help them do imaging, they'd be very appreciative. But they have, like Iceland, a very precious genomic database. We, we started a collaboration with them, but it's not, not very well staffed. The images are in short supply uh, in, in Qatar, but it, it, it could be uh, valuable. So just in summary, um, Enigma coordinates international neuroimaging studies uh, of brain disorders across, I think it's now four, 45 countries, that analyze those four or five data modalities. The brain signatures do change with, with, with three main factors, duration of illness, age of onset, uh, and, and other modulations, I mean, usually medication if it's, if it's working. But like dementia, there are many subtypes, and so those of you that work in Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, FTD, I mean, you know that dementia isn't one thing. I mean, there are subtypes. So I think the way the field will move in the future is to say, well, meta-analysis is a first step, but it isn't really that everyone's effects are going to be the same. E even if you were looking at a disorder in different countries, there would be subtypes that you need to, to understand with different prognosis and perhaps different treatments. Genomic screens have identified a lot of loci that accelerate brain, oops, brain, brain aging. Uh, there's an interest in imaging genomics of identifying why a genetic risk factor influences brain health or disease. A lot of them have, like APOE and TREM2, very clear effects uh, in, in brain scans. But to be honest, the rarer variants have the larger effects. So if you, if you remember Kari Stephenson's uh, talk yesterday, one of the reasons that DECODE is studying rare variants is that they've assessed enough Icelandic people that you can find them. I mean, there's pl plenty of examples. But they are often uh, prodromal uh, conditions for um, psychiatric conditions that are quite difficult to study otherwise. And so you have a very genetically well-controlled background to understand the emergence uh, of a disorder. There are new groups in Enigma testing TMS. I mean, there are interventions. That adds another dimension of variation in protocols. I mean, if you are familiar with transcranial tra magnetic stimulation, it is effective uh, in major depression and other disorders, but the parameters of how often you do it and how and the physics of the uh, stimulator are done very differently across the world. So that would be an interesting application of maybe not meta-analysis, but coordinated analysis to see which experimental parameters are the best uh, for those things. So if you want to join in, so this is very, very open. I mean, if you have an idea for a project, do, do join us. There's a, a YouTube channel. Here, here's some Dutch people telling you about their, 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 their work. Um, or, or go to the website. Uh, you can join Enigma, just join the mailing list, see what sorts of things are going on. And again, I mean, number one, a big thank you to all the individuals who have scanned people uh, for Enigma. These are meetings in different countries. There's, I think, one in Mongolia in, 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 in there um, that are contributing uh, to, to the overall uh, activity. And then the funded, I mean, ju just a word on how this is funded. So NIH funds about half of it. NIH will send funds out of the US. I mean, this is, this is uh, um, it's, it's fine. But the national biobanks of each country are usually the primary funder of the data collection uh, in, in, in each funding. And there's some private funding, not much. Uh, the U.S. Alzheimer's Association said, well, APOE2 is a protective genotype for Alzheimer's. About 10% of us carry it. Could you have a look and see what APOE2 is doing? So there, there, there's some smaller projects that uh, private funders uh, have funded. And here's a sort of philosophical note. I, 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 is anyone Greek? Anyone read, read, read ancient? They, can, can you read this very, uh, it, it's, a, it's a bit of a difficult one. Um, but can you read any of the... Uh... Okay. It's very old. It's, so modern Greek's not written like that. I've I, I got to be fair to you. So modern Greek isn't, it's not written inside. But I, th this is a, a loose paraphrase of Aristotle's metaphysics. Um, and just to prove you that, to you that it does say this, so the little bit at the bottom says, 
Ek panton sunathroid zominon genestai t megatos, which is the bottom. I wasted four years studying ancient Greek. And um, it means, uh, you know, individually we contribute little to the quest for truth by, but by working together. And sunathroid zominon is from a giant pile of everything that has been brought together. Genestai uh, t megatos. I mean, you know this. There, there will be created something enormous. T megatos. Or me, me, mega, I guess is what it is. So I think people, well, maybe he was better than most, but he appreciated early that working together uh, was beneficial. So once again, th th thanks for coming. Thanks to Alan and Catherine and Morris for such a wonderful meeting. And it's been a real pleasure learning from all of you uh, these last few days. Thanks very much. And just as a throwaway to make us all feel inadequate, he says, oh, I wasted four years learning ancient Greek. Don't do it. <laughs> Don't do it. Don't waste it. <laughs> do, we, do we have questions for Paul? Gotcha. Yeah, thank, thank you very much, Paul. This was really fascinating and, uh, and inspiring in many, in many respects. Um, Thank you very much. So, so I have a question. So you, you are studying neurological conditions, psychiatric uh, conditions uh, that are very frequent. Yeah? So um, there are these so-called rare diseases. Um, and um, together, they are also quite significant. But, but there are, of course, genetic variants where you have only a couple of families uh, yeah, in, in each country. and. Um, so would, would you see a possibility, for example, through deep learning um, to, to, to model these, these samples in a better way so that you can really compare it? Because otherwise, you have quite some, some difference between the diseases, independence on how frequent they are. And the second part of the question is related. So I hope that you do not stop me for the second part of the question. Uh, the, I mean, you have also. In, in many patients, several, several symptoms, several syndromes, also several diagnoses. So a lot of patients are, again, very mixed. Um, uh, and, and again, they have a different background. They, they have a different sociology. So, so all these factors then, then act. And then that's the second part. So if you, if you look then to, to the patient, who has maybe a vascular dementia, has also something else, has a tumor, has a stroke, has a, I don't know what else. And then it becomes also very rare in the sense that it's going to the individual place. So could you comment on this yes, yes. tension between <coughs> large samples yes. and, and individual signatures? Yes. So I, I think, Kasha, that that's a very, very wise point. I mean, I think simplifying this as diagnostic categories that we're going to scan schizophrenia patients, for example. I mean, as you said, many patients have comorbidities, and even if they don't, they have very different backgrounds. And so if you look at the dementia field recently, they have begun to categorize it biologically. So there's this ATNV system, the amyloid tau uh, neurodegeneration. The V is vascular disease. And I think precisely the point you're making is that any one of us in old age might have different dimensions or different degrees of amyloid buildup, tau, neurodegeneration, or vascular disease, some exclusively, some mixtures. And so I, I think as many of the pre presenters have shown, I mean, there is a sort of multidimensional way to model this. And I think as a first step, people have been aggregating groups of people in very high degree. But in the process, they've realized that the heterogeneity uh, is emerging. I mean, the Parkinson's example, I mean, that, even if you agree it's one disease, the staging would mean that it's, it's not adequate to have a prototype uh, for that disease. It's, it's, it's progressive. So I think maybe, I mean, with, with your efforts through the Human Brain Project and through the partnerships here, being able to see different data sets that are collected at different sites, it lets you begin to model these dimensions of variation, both the disease heterogeneity, and I think, as you also mentioned importantly, the, the cultural background uh, of, of the individuals. Um, I and mean, it may very well be that the prevalence of certain diseases uh, is less in certain countries, but we don't know whether that has to do with the biology or other risk factors. And so, I mean, even studying something like dementia, 
uh, in India, for example, versus here, there are people that believe that the nutrition and lifestyle influence the trajectory or the kind of dementia that is there. And still other people would say this is partially genetics and ancestry, and no doubt it's many other things that we haven't thought of today. So I think you make a very important point. I mean, part of the benefit of these international cooperations is that you have uh, the perspective to model all of these extra axes of variation, both experimentally uh, and in the biology, and then perhaps in domains we haven't even entertained. Uh, that might influence the results. And it, it seems like it's a good thing. So some of the non-reproducible findings of the past are now being brought back into a framework where they do actually fit a, a broader picture, where the, the full axes of, of variation are, uh, are modeled. To go into your first question on deep learning, and the people more expert here than, than I am in this, I, we think we're very excited about it. I mean, I, I, you know, using these broad databases as training data uh, to model disease is, is, is very exciting. Particularly if you could make, uh, we were talking with, with Greg here yesterday about, about synthetic data. And so this sounds like a bizarre thing. I mean, making a little bit like uh, Victor's virtual patient, I mean, making new examples of brains uh, that represent uh, diseases. That is an interesting intellectual exercise, but it also proves helpful for training uh, deep learning algorithms that are very data hungry. I mean, a lot of deep learning algorithms, like the ones applicable to language, they need enormous amounts of data to be fed in to model the spectrum of variation that would be seen. And so uh, I don't know if others have comments on that. I mean, how the AI methods might uh, be used fruitfully in, in conjunction with a distributed international data. I mean, it's a very, I think all of us, it's an area that we're quite, quite excited about. Okay, I guess it's my turn. I'm, I'm going to bounce a little bit off Catherine's questions because, uh, first of all, that was amazing. The whole thing is amazing. Thank you. Um, it's a tour de force, and it will make a difference. Um, but I'm looking at the potential that sits within the data sets, many of which, obviously, you gave us a big picture of. And when we look at things like bipolar and ADHD, yeah. right, these are disorders that we know there are some, some levels of stratification yes. within. Yes. There are drug responders and non-responders. No. There are those that have been responsive, responsive to nutritional or yes. other interventions and not. So um, how deeply phenotyped yeah. Yeah. are the individuals that you already have in the data set that yeah. would enable us to step in to look yeah. at the gene environment aspects of those brain changes. So that's question number one. <laughs> question number two, which is kind of related, and, and like jumped out at me the moment. Let him answer the first one. Okay, yeah, go on. All right. Go on. But it, Jade, it's like the British Parliament where you get two questions. Right. <laughs> exactly. so, so, yeah, I mean, the deep phenotyping is a little, you have to be fair about this. It, it's a bit of a weakness of many of these databases, not because they didn't individually do a good job, they did, but the overlap is, is, is not always there, and yeah. particularly for medication. And so one of the efforts, the Milken Institute funds it, is to try and inventorize the medication better across it was bipolar, and bipolar that you mentioned right. is a good example, because there could be subtypes. I mean, people take lithium, valproate, many other, many other things, and no doubt some of them are responsive to those, and it'd be good to see in the brain data who, mm -hmm. who is. But it, it seems to require something that's not impossible for people to go back to the medical charts and dig out. Um, I mean, medication, as you know, is complicated. It's not just what medications people had. It's whether they took it, when yeah. they were taking it, and for how long. And that type of very you know, heterogeneous data is usually in medical charts. And so I think that's a great point. It's often something that the funders don't really provide funding to do, to do some archaeology, some dredging of past data. But very, very valuable, because I think the points that you've made, I mean, practically, if you could find patients that uh, you know, had a certain lifestyle that was beneficial or not, or had a certain medication sequence that was beneficial or not, that metadata, I mean, from an imagist standpoint, right. it's metadata, is probably the most important at all. Yeah, and so, uh, and I mean, you, you know this, Jane, I mean, there's efforts to systematize the collection of that data. Our, our doc in the United States was trying to encourage people at the outset 
uh, to collect similar things so that this wasn't a big problem later on. But I mean, to be honest with you, I mean, things like diet, nutrition, yep. some biobanks do a very, very good job of this, but others completely overlook it. I mean, for you know, obvious reasons of funding and, and, and scope for that project. I, I, we'll have to change that. So the second question is about the almost throwaway comment about the anorexia data. Yeah, yeah. Because I'm immediately sitting here going, okay, a number of these individuals will have basically put their body into a, a, a syst system of extreme waste, yeah. both metabolically, hormonally, there will be male-female differences, yeah. Yeah. that within the context of those data, there will be some really valuable gene environment, oh, yes. body affecting mind and vice versa interactions that, and I, how deep are people yeah. looking into those things right now? Because that in and of itself could be a great backdrop in otherwise normal individuals for yeah. many of the other effectors we need to look yeah. at in the other disorders that will have a nutritional component. Yeah. I, I think, Jay, that's a great, great question. So the eating disorders group is one of the most interesting. It, one of our postdocs, Clara Moreau, who was at McGill, many of you know her, is leading this effort to chart exactly the question that you've said in people with anorexia who recover and those who don't. Some of them, I mean, anorexia has a very, very high rate of suicide yeah. of all the psychiatric disorders. So some of the leading questions are, could you predict suicidality? Could you see if, if that can be uh, inferred from, from data? And even, this is more controversial, even in the general population, if you had a biobank of individuals that didn't have any sign of anorexia, I mean, would there be a, a predictive test in the genome or the images uh, or anything like that? I think it is one of the less studied disorders, I mean, at least in the US, there isn't as much data uh, with, with neuroimaging as, as some of the others. And so as you, as, as you mentioned, gene environment interactions, and they, they often require an order of power that's even more than the gene study in the first place, uh, unless it's all gene environment interaction. I mean, you, you know those classical cases where, like you know, PKU, where the, it, it's very, very clear what the environmental interaction is, like uh, Curry's lung cancer, cigarette smoke, and genetics uh, a, a, a example. But I, I, I agree, I mean, that should be where the field should move, because if there is a gene environment interaction, it's much more likely you could do something than if there's just a gene effect. Is, uh, is the metabolic microbiome screening that you do in those individuals you have in the genome? Yeah, the, so there's an effort starting on um, metabolomics and uh, microbiome. It's very new to me. Many others of you here may have more experience in this, but that seems like another way in, doesn't it? Because it's a more active readout of your biology. 